Our focus this morning will be on the last two verses of Luke chapter 14. But I'm going to read from verse 25 so that we can see the context in which Jesus spoke these words. And hopefully we have some understanding of this difficult passage. Uh, we've had two sermons on this section of Jesus' teaching and we're going to wrap it up this morning with the final challenge that Jesus gave. So please, if you would follow along as I read aloud and then we'll pray and ask for God's help as we give our attention to the preaching of his word. Luke chapter 14, beginning reading at verse 25. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me, and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest haply, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, or that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king? going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an embassage, and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his savour, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill. But men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we ask now in the name of your Son Jesus, our Saviour, that you would help us to understand the text of Scripture before us. I pray not only would you uh, give us understanding, but you would press the truths here upon our hearts. I pray that you would challenge us if that be our need. I pray that you would encourage us and lift us up if that be our need. Father, we pray that you would, as you see fit, afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. We pray these things again in Jesus' name. Amen. I think many of you, uh, perhaps all of you, would respond with a hearty Amen to the first three words of verse 34. Salt is good. Uh, we like salt, perhaps too much. Now, I suspect some of you on, on doctor's orders are trying to maintain a low salt diet and you're doing so begrudgingly. Uh, you'd love to sprinkle those veggies or that steak with some salt and you're not allowed to. I feel for you. <laughs> now, we like salt in the kitchen because it adds flavour and because it preserves. And we like salt because it acts as a disinfectant. Uh, we will wash out our eye if it's got something in it or we'll wash a wound with saline solution. A fancy name for salty water. Salt has that wonderful cleansing property. These are the same reasons why people valued salt in the ancient world, perhaps even more than we do, given that there wasn't refrigeration and there weren't modern disinfectants and antibiotics. I also wonder if the average person in the Greco-Roman world had the same access to a wide variety of spices like we do today. Uh, we can go to Woolies or Coles, uh, maybe even to Aldi, I don't know, and, and there is a spice section where there are literally dozens of different spices to choose from and most are not that expensive. But thanks in large part to Alexander the Great, there was a spice trade from the east to the west in Bible times, but I suspect many of those spices were expensive and beyond the reach of the common person. So if you wanted to flavour your food, you were probably much more dependent on salt than we are today. The bottom line is that when Jesus said salt is good, everyone in his audience would have agreed with him. 
It was a very important commodity in everyday life. We like salt. And Jesus liked to use salt as a metaphor or an illustration. And that makes sense because it was something common, people knew what it was, and they understood its properties. There are two other occasions in the Gospels where Jesus is recorded using salt as an illustration. And not just salt, but specifically the idea of salt losing its saltiness, salt losing its taste, losing its properties. Apparently this was not uncommon in that part of the world. Now I'm not going to go into an extended discussion of the chemistry of salt. I would be way out of my depth. I'm not going to go into an extended discussion of the geology of Palestine in order to explain this phenomenon. One sentence from William Hendrickson's commentary will suffice. He writes, The salt from the marshes and lagoons, or from the rocks in the neighbourhood of the Dead Sea, easily acquires a stale or alkaline taste because of its mixture with gypsum and other substances. This was what could happen to the salt that people bought and used in their kitchens and they understood this or else Jesus wouldn't have mentioned it without any explanation. People were well aware that salt could lose its savour, its saltiness. Now with that in mind, let's read our text once more and take a moment to think it through. Verse 34, if you'd like to look there in your Bible. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his savour, wherewith shall it be seasoned? And we have a very literal translation of the Greek text in the King James Version, and it leaves us wondering what the it is at the end of the verse. Wherewith shall it be seasoned? The it is the salt. Okay, what Jesus was saying was along these lines. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? The answer is implied in the next verse. It can't be restored. <laughs> Once the salt's saltiness is gone, it's gone. Verse 35. It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill. It can't be used in an agricultural setting. You can't even mix it with manure to make fertilizer. It has no use whatsoever, but men cast it out. And then Jesus says, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So that's the illustration. It's fairly straightforward. And Jesus wanted his audience to pay attention. He wanted them to listen to what he was saying. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. But the question is, what did he mean? <laughs> what did he mean by closing this address to the multitudes with this metaphor? He expected them to understand what he meant. Or perhaps he wanted to make them think and try to figure it out. And that's the task before us this morning. We have to answer this question. How does this closing illustration connect to what Jesus said in verses 26 to 33? Well, let's once again remind ourselves of the circumstances in which Jesus gave this teaching. Verse 25, And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, Jesus had become an extremely popular figure in Galilee and Judea. He had no problem drawing a crowd. On this particular day, as he was travelling somewhere, hundreds of people were following him, perhaps thousands of people. And as I have pointed out in the last two sermons, it's significant that Jesus stopped, turned around, looked at this vast crowd and said these very hard things. What was he doing? He was pressing these people, challenging them about their motives, challenging them about the condition of their hearts. Why were they following him? Did they really believe who he was, who he claimed to be? Did they really want to be his disciples? Or were they following him for other reasons? We might say that he was endeavouring to sort out the sheep from the goats. In verses 26 and 27, Jesus told these people that to be his disciple, they would have to love him above all else, more than their own families, 
He was asking for that which is due only to God. And he could ask for that because he was God and he is God. And he spoke plainly about suffering. To be his disciple, they would have to take up a cross. We don't really appreciate how offensive that would have sounded. A cross? Are you kidding me? And then, as we saw last Sunday in verses 28 to 33, Jesus emphasised the seriousness of being his disciple. It was not something to be entered into lightly because it would involve saying goodbye to everything they owned. Jesus laid all this out in very strong terms. Again, he was pressing these people and he closed the sermon with this illustration about salt. Jesus wasn't saying the same thing as when he used this illustration in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. And he wasn't saying the same thing as when he used this illustration in Mark chapter 9 where he was talking about repentance. They were different contexts with different emphases. When we consider what Jesus was saying to this crowd and what his purpose was, we understand that he meant something like this. Salt is good. It's good that you've been drawn to me. It's good that you're interested in me. It's good that you have these positive feelings towards me. Now, what's going on inside of you is a good thing. If your interest in me proves to be like salt that loses its saltiness, it's worthless. It's good for nothing. This was a fitting illustration. This was Jesus at the end of the message bringing the hammer down. This was perhaps the sharpest of all of these hard sayings. He was confronting these people about the genuineness of their desire to follow him. Was it real? Would they follow through? Would their saltiness remain? Or would the stirrings of their heart prove to be shallow and fleeting and therefore good for nothing? Sadly, this turned out to be a very apt description of those who were listening to him on this particular day. This was exactly what would happen. They would lose their saltiness. Their fascination with Jesus would peter out. Their interest would wane. Their commitment to him would prove to be ephemeral and worthless. We know this because where did Jesus end up? Not too many months into the future, Jesus would be forsaken by almost everyone who was ever associated with him. Instead of adoring him, the crowds would be baying for his blood. Eventually, he would be there outside the walls of Jerusalem, hanging on a cross, surrounded by just a tiny handful of faithful disciples, mainly faithful women. What Jesus talks about in these final two verses in chapter 14 is something that we don't like to think about. And we might be tempted to use the uniqueness of the context to explain it away. To say that Jesus' words here in the Gospel according to Luke have no real relevance to us today. But that would be a grave mistake. Jesus was describing a phenomenon the Bible speaks of that we call apostasy. This English word comes from the Greek word apostasia, a word that means to fall away. And it's an uncomfortable subject. I confess that I feel uneasy talking about this from the pulpit. I've been uneasy about this for the last few days. But I feel uneasy because it can sound like I am making judgments about where people stand with God and because it's a subject that hits close to home. But this is where we have come to today in our study through the Gospel of Luke. I, I haven't chosen this topic. The Lord has. Jesus talked about this in other places and so did the apostles. They talked about what this illustration represents in this particular context. The salt losing its saltiness. It represents a person who has an interest in Jesus. 
a person who may profess faith in Jesus, a, a person who shows some of the outward signs of being one of his disciples, but who falls away and proves not to be. The crowd in this passage showed some of those outward signs. They were following Jesus, they were interested in him and what he had to say. But save for a tiny minority, they did not believe that he was the Christ. They were not converted. And soon enough, they were gone. Now Jesus talked about this in one of his most famous parables, the parable of the sower, sometimes called the parable of the soils. I'm sure you know it. The farmer sowed the seed and some of that seed fell on rocky ground. It sprung up immediately. There were signs of life. But what happened? It withered away because it lacked moisture. Or in Mark's account, when the sun was up, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. The seed is the word of God. The four soils represent four responses to the word. This is what the seed that fell on the rocky ground represents. Luke chapter 8 verse 13. Jesus said, They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe and in a time of temptation fall away. Isn't this what Jesus was talking about in our text? Doesn't this also illustrate the behaviour of the multitudes who followed him? They received his word with joy. There was excitement, there was enthusiasm. They believed some things about him. But when he said hard things, when his program didn't align with their expectations, when the religious establishment came out aggressively against him, when following him had uncomfortable implications, these people fell away, for they had no root. There was an emotional response, maybe even a kind of mental assent, but there was no root of faith, there was no life in the inner man, their hearts were unchanged. We've been studying the book of 2 Peter in our home groups and in 2 Peter the Apostle deals with this phenomenon in a different context. He was writing after Pentecost to local churches. Please if you would turn over there now to 2 Peter to chapter 2. The people had come into these churches People who, under the influence of Christian teaching, had cleaned up their lives. They displayed the outward signs of being a Christian. Look please at verse 20, 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 20. Peter says that these ones had escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. And these individuals knew about Jesus. They were familiar with the teachings of Jesus and they had lived at least outwardly in keeping with his teaching. There was a time when if we, we'd have met these people at a church gathering, we would have had no reason to doubt that they were Christians. But, Peter says, if you look at the verse, if having escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning, verse 21. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they had known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them, verse 22. But it is happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. These people fell away. They were caught up once again in the pollutions of the world. And earlier in the chapter, Peter describes how they were now living. They had become a malign influence in those Christian communities. They were greedy. They were getting drunk. They were practicing and advocating sexual immorality. They were prideful and deceitful. They went back to an unrighteous way of life and were encouraging people in the churches to join them. And it demonstrated that they had never really changed. Uh, Peter finishes this section of the letter with two very graphic and memorable proverbs. That of a dog returning to its vomit and a pig returning to the mud. 
He says that this was what these people had done. These pictures describe them. In the words of one author, the true nature of these people never changed. A dog may leave its vomit for a while, but will return to it. A sow might well be spruced up and look clean, but it will still find the mud pit enticing. A dog returns to his vomit because he's a dog. And that's what dogs do. These people fell away. They were entangled again in the pollution of the world and overcome because they were of the world. The inner man had not been changed. They had not been born from above. Not been made to partake in the divine nature. They had not been born again. The salt losing its saltiness. The seed that fell on stony ground. The dog returning to its vomit. These describe this category of person. An individual who seems to be a follower of Jesus. A, a person who professes to be a Christian but who falls away and lives in a manner indistinguishable from the unregenerate world. They no longer have any interest in God or the Bible or the church. They fall away because they never had a living faith. They never truly believed. They never had new life in Christ by the Spirit. Now you might be sitting there thinking, well that's very interesting pastor, thank you for expositing the text and explaining all of this, but it doesn't seem very relevant to me. Uh, you're talking about other people, not me. If that's what you're thinking, then let me say that I hope you're right. <laughs> I hope I am talking about other people and not about you. I hope you will not fall away because you have been born again. Because you do have new life in Christ. I hope you are trusting in Jesus as your one and only Saviour from sin and death. I hope you have seen the cross and understood and believed that Jesus was there dying for your sins. I hope you believe in the deepest recesses of your heart that without him and what he accomplished for you, you would be lost and on your way to hell. Jesus challenged the multitude who had come out to see him, who were following him down that Galilean road. And so he challenges us. It would be remiss of me as I preach from these verses in Luke chapter 14 if I failed to press you on this very point. Are you here today in church because you have committed your life to Jesus Christ? Because you love him and want to worship him? I hope so. I hope I am not talking about you this morning. But I am sure... I'm talking about people you know and people you love. People who have fallen away, or at least that's what it looks like. They have walked away, not just from church, but from the faith. The way they're living in no way resembles the Christian life. They're not interested in the gospel or the Bible, and they're not repentant. Maybe they've even turned against what the Bible teaches. This is where some of my best friends growing up have ended up. Today, they have zero interest in the things of the Lord. You would never mistake them for a Christian, and that's sad. I can't imagine what a heartache it would be if it was, if it was one of my siblings or one of my children. What do we do with this? What do we do with this? It's not just theory. It's not just a section in a systematic theology book in the chapter on soteriology. This is something that has touched each one of our lives and it's not only heartbreaking, it's confusing. We wonder what to make of that person's profession and what to make of those months and years where they seem to be living the Christian life. And we have all these questions that can eat away at us and that probably can't be answered. And maybe we wonder if we're to blame in some way. I don't have any great or original insights into this. <laughs> As I read God's word, I find that there are five things that we are to do 
when it comes to those who seem to have fallen away. And with these, I'll close. Number one, we love them. We love them, we never stop. And we don't shun them or shut, shut them out of our lives. We don't give up on them. We show them grace and kindness. And if they don't want to be around us, that's fine. But we make sure they know our door is always open to them because one day, in a moment of crisis, when life isn't going as they hoped it would, they might just walk through that door and be ready to listen. Number one, we love them. And then number two, we pray for them. We pray for the Holy Spirit to work in their hearts. We pray for God to be merciful. We pray that they will see the error of their ways and come to faith in Jesus. Number three, we live out the gospel in front of them. By God's grace, we live an authentic Christian life, a faithful life, a life full of the fruit of the Spirit. We should never underestimate the power of a genuine Christian witness. Number four, we share the gospel with them as we have opportunity. That's what they need. They need to hear that life-giving message. And then finally, number five, we take all of our questions and all of our sadness and we hand it over to Jesus. We rest in the wisdom and the righteousness of God. God always does the right thing. And as we rest in his wisdom and in his, in his righteousness, he will give us peace. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Be careful for nothing. You know, do not be anxious about anything, not even about this, as serious and as troubling as it is. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, <laughs> shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. God knows that person who has walked away. He knows their heart. And he is not going to be unfair or unjust in his dealings with them, or with anyone for that matter. And furthermore, he has promised us that one day our hearts will ache no more. God shall, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. It is a difficult subject. It is painful when it's someone you love who has turned their back on the gospel and the Christian life. But there is grace, there is comfort, even for this. Let us draw near to God and rest in his love. Amen.